So in this next couple of lectures, we're going to talk about a completely different type of analysis for distribution systems called reliability analysis. And we're going to talk about how we quantify this, how we can put a number on it, uh, basically what's behind it, what are causes of having poor reliability, how we can actually do metrics around this, and then do things that would lead to circuit improvements. And just before I get into the lecture material, I just want to provide um, a little bit of background on this, kind of a little bit more from a political standpoint. And so the public has a view of reliability that kind of that kind of varies, you know, depending on what's the, the last thing that happened. And so right after a storm, you see a lot of focus on reliability in the media. This is kind of an example uh, from a couple years ago, where in the Carolinas, we had a really bad winter storm. And because of this, a lot of people lost power. Um, the article header here kind of denotes it could have been worse, but you, know, you had hundreds of thousands of people without power at the same time. And so whenever something like this happens, there's um, it has a lot of political implications as, as far as you know, blaming different government officials for this. And this is kind of a little uh, article about the, the run up to the to the storm and, you know, how we actually had, um, you know, took like a day or two to actually recover from it. But if you look at what happens before the storm, um, when this isn't really on people's mind, then what kind of articles do you see in, in the media? Well, like an article for the same service territory, residents voice concern over Duke Energy tree removal process. And so the utility in this case was trying to prepare for these storms by cutting trees that might have fallen on lines during these types of events. And of course, when they try to do that, then the public, it, uh, some members might get kind of outraged with the fact that trees are removed from their property in order for them to do this. And so it seems like we're always kind of going back and forth between this, basically the actions we could take before the event happens and spending money on this. And of course, when these events finally occur, you know, everybody's all upset about it and say, well, why didn't we really prepare for this? But it always kind of comes down to, well, nobody really wants to spend that type of money ahead of time or being in inconvenienced ahead of time. And, and so anyway, this is just a little bit of background. If you guys read the the news, you know, you'll see these types of cycles where we have uh, a storm um, cases here. We had the big outage in, in, in Texas, but then you look at like five, 10 years ago and there were people spending money on this and, you know, it wasn't really the case. And, and so anyway, this is just some of the things that kind of go on in the background um, is concerning reliability. What we're kind of getting into is we're, we're kind of getting into another era where we're, we're getting more concerned about what we refer to as grid resilience. Um, it used to be that, you know, these major storms only really occurred, you know, once every so often, but it looks like the frequency of these are actually increasing, most likely due to climate change. And so it, it what we've been talking a lot about now, you know, like in, in meetings and in the literature would be with this, this concept of grid resilience. And this really pertains more to large scale events. You know, in this set of lectures, we're gonna talk more about smaller scale events, but um, now people are talking a lot about grid resistant, grid resilience. We're basically, you know, trying to build the grid in such a way to make it more resilient to these large, massive disturbances such as ice storms or, or hurricanes or whatever. And when we talk about resilience, what we're sort of focused on is we're sort of focused on basically when the event occurs and we're like in this phase one, given that we're gonna lose a lot of customers, uh, there's gonna be quite a few outages, basically, how do we build our system in such a way where we kind of reduce this amount of time we're in phase two where a lot of people are outage and then reduce the amount of time it takes to get everybody restored back. So we get all the customers online, um, the same number as we had like before the, the, the event would occur. 
And so there's a, there's a lot of work on going on this. This isn't something we could really readily integrate in the class yet, but this is kind of where things are headed as far as reliability. So I'm going to be focusing more on what we call these non-major events and basically how we can build our systems to withstand those, but just realize that there's also these larger scale events that's actually starting to get a lot more attention now. So in, in this set of lectures, what I'm gonna do for reliability analysis is I'm gonna break this into two different parts. We're gonna have a part one and a part two, where I'll start off in part one by just going through some of the reliability definitions and then talk about what are the different sort of failures in a grid that's gonna impact reliability. And then get into also how we kind of um, parameterize this by component type. And then in the third part, we'll, get in, we'll start getting into some system modeling, kind of like the equivalent of, you know, how do you do like a power flow or short circuit study? You know, how do you do reliability analysis if we're talking about distribution circuits? And I'll start off by doing a simple example for part one, but basically part two is going to be a lot more examples in there now that we cover the basis in, in part one. So going back to this diagram that we've been using so far for talking about distribution circuits, where I primarily was using this to talk about voltage regulation, then what's kind of going on as far as reliability um, and how it links to protection? And John Guida, you know, has provided a lecture on this topic, and so I'm not going to be reviewing everything that he talked about. But basically, you're going to have different sort of faults that are going to occur on circuits. It just is just kind of a fact of life. And so, if we had like a fault uh, on this piece of cable right here, then what we would expect to happen? We expect the fuse to blow on this, right? Um, if we were going to have a fault on this overhead section coming out of the substation, then we expect like the circuit breaker to operate. Now, what what's the difference between these two events? Well, in this first event right here, what would happen is I would just lose the customers below that fuse. But if I had a fault on this particular location, number two, if that circuit breaker trips open and stays open, then all the customers on the circuit are going to be out. And so what you see is that we're going to have these different sort of fault events, but depending on the location of the fault event, it's going to have a different impact in terms of the number of customers that were outage. If I were going to have an event, say, um, right here, then what would happen is we would have um, the recloser operate, hopefully before the circuit breaker, and then we would lose all these customers out here, but then these customers upstream of the recloser would, would be okay, right? And so <clears throat> what you need to be knowing as far as protection operation for this particular unit on reliability analysis as you need to know what are all the different possible fault locations. Sometimes we refer to those as contingency events. Then you need to know how the protection is going to be operating for each of those different types of fault locations. Because then that's going to be used to kind of tell us what we expect to see given that we would have certain failure rates of all these different components in our system. Now, one other thing that could be happening for this particular circuit, if we go back to this scenario number two, is what would happen is if we have a fault here, what if we had automation where I could operate this tie switch automatically? Well, what I could do then is I could open up this recloser, I could close this switch, and then what I could do basically is I could restore service to all these customers below the recloser while we're waiting to fix this fault at location number two. And that could be done manually by a crew or that could be done through automation where we're automating the operation of those switches. So those are the types of things we're gonna be talking about in here is basically trying to get a baseline for what we'd expect to see for reliability for the different fault types. And then what are some things we could do to improve those metrics. We're going to be talking about two different types of interruptions, although we're going to be more um, 
interested in calculating the second category. The two different types of interruptions are going to be momentary and sustained. And so if you go back to this previous diagram, you know, if I have a fault that causes a circuit breaker to open and it recloses back in and the fault's been cleared, you know, that would be a momentary event where people would see a blink. And most of the time, you know, you would see the lights flicker, but that's about it. You know, that would, could be due to the, a momentary operation of an upstream breaker. And so we've, we've got all these different momentary events all the time, but it turns out that if these events are less than say like five minutes, and depending on the regulatory um, jurisdiction that we're talking about, maybe this limit could be one minute, but basically if this event's gonna be usually less than five minutes, it doesn't usually count against us. So if we're a, a, a utility and we're concerned about industrial or commercial customers on these circuits, yeah, momentaries might be important because that can cause devices to trip. But if we're talking about primarily residential circuits, residential customers usually aren't bothered too much by these momentary events. A sustained event would be a situation where if I had a fault on this cable in this fuse blue, that's a crew would have to go out into the field and reconfigure the circuit to get the customers back online. Maybe that's gonna take like two to four hours for that to happen. And so that type of event is what we refer to as a sustained event. It's gonna be longer than five minutes in duration. And this normally is gonna require some type of equipment repair. So a crew's gonna to have to go out there usually and do something. And both of these outages are gonna factor into uh, standardized customer reliability indices, but we're gonna be a little bit more interested on this sustained category. So when we talk about reliability assessment, what we're talking about in this case is getting into issues related to customer interruptions. This is normally due to line faults and equipment failures on distribution circuits. Uh, we're gonna be kind of focused on these sustained interruptions that are gonna occur for more than a few minutes, right? And that's again, where the indices tend to start to uh, take effect. And we may or might, may not include these momentary interruptions. You know, for the most part, uh, a lot of the reclosers we have in the field are not even monitored by SCADA. And so we don't know exactly how many momentary interruptions are exactly out there. They, they don't tend to generate as many customer complaints, especially if they're on residential circuits. It, it's really kind of hard to kind of quantify, right? And so um, again, what we're gonna be focused on here is more of the sustained interruptions, even though in some of the examples, what I'm gonna be doing is also doing some calculations around some of those momentary interruptions as well. So for our commercial and industrial customers on circuit, you know, there's going to be a cost of poor reliability. Uh, they're going to have a dollar impact. Residential to some extent, but not the same as, as industrial commercial customers. And so if you have an industrial customer on distribution and they're running a process, let's say, then they're going to lose product that's in on the manufacturing line or the process line. Uh, this could lead to like broken equipment. So like if you're doing something with in textiles and you have an interruption, you usually have to clear all the product out of your equipment. It kind of gets tangled up in there and costs it, it takes some manpower in order to get the line back up and running again. If you're talking about like a shopping center, if you have an outage and you can't run the cash registers, then there's going to be lost sales. If you have an office building and people can't work, there's going to be lost production due to that. Um, there's intangible types of things too, where there's it's causing some inconvenience, but it's sometimes kind of hard to put a dollar number right. And this all depends on the type of the customer. I mean, if if they have a process going on that if it's interrupted, it's going to cost them a lot of money. They don't have any sort of backup capability as far as generators or the generators don't come online fast enough. Maybe, you know, some customers might have a more of a hardened uh, process than others where some of these internal, some of these customers have um, unreparable power 
uh, backup systems and other key equipment where some other customers don't. And so there's a variety of different costs you can consider. And um, this kind of depends on the customer type if you want to put like a dollar value on it. So what's kind of interesting is there's been some projects on time to trying to quantify this, the, the cost of poor reliability. And the US Department of Energy has a cost calculator referred to as ICE. And if you go to this site, what you can do is you can actually plug in values and for the service territory that state you're in, it'll actually come up with some numbers as far as the what's you know currently the value of poor reliability. And so if you were going to plug in the fact that you have a state, what's called a safety number, this number is two. So it means we have on the average two interruptions per year. There's a SATI number where this is a number of outage minutes per year. Uh, you can put in a, what's uh, the time it takes to fix a problem. You can put in the total number of residential and non-residential customers. And what it'll actually do is it'll actually come up some metrics as, as far as what's the cost of poor reliability. In this case right here, they're predicting on the order of about $50 million for, for this um, service territory, right? So as far as putting a number on this, um, in general for reliability, there's a lot of different indices to talk about how reliable something is. Uh, one type of number is what's called an availability number where you talk about the percent of the time you're, you're up, the percent of time that you have power. So if you had 99% availability, which seems pretty good, this is what's sometimes referred to as two nines of reliability. You might think that's pretty good, but if you look at 1% of a year that you're gonna be out, that's 3.7 days. So two nines isn't really very good. Uh, if you talk about three nines, then you're at 8.8 .8 hours, at your four nines, you're at 52 minutes. So this is kind of in the ballpark of where you probably want to be for residential customers. And then for more critical processes, you could be talking about six nines or nine nines. Nine nines would be just being out for 1.9 cycles. And so if, if you're running a data center and you've got a bunch of servers running, you really need to have nine nines if you're running a big server farm. And so there's all sorts of money you spend on these types of server farms that you wouldn't be spending for like regular residential customers. But the, the problem with this is you talk about the number of nines, it, it doesn't really give us the right type of resolution because we normally want to think in terms of, well, how many outages does somebody have per year and how long are they sitting in the dark? How many minutes or how many hours? So, there's been a set of utility oriented reliability indices that um, the engineers have come up with instead. And this is really useful if you're talking about like a whole utility that has like millions of customers. And so you could, you could talk about these numbers for the whole system. You can break them down per substation or by feeder. You can have these by customer type. And this is used by ut not only utilities, but public regulatory agencies to track system performance. And so utilities have to report this every year. And if these numbers get worse and worse, then the public utility regulatory body is going to start to question whether the utility is spending enough money on reliability. And so the standards that we're going to be using in this class is from a IEEE standard, IEEE 1366, uh, Guide for Electric Power Distribution Reliability Indices. So the numbers we're going to be using a lot in here are safety and safety. The safety number is the number of interruptions you're going to have in a unit time, usually per year. And what you would do is you would take the total number of customer interruptions and you divide by the total number of customers served. And note for these indices that we weight every customer the same. So an industrial customer that's consuming megawatts would be weighed the same as say like a residential customer that's consuming kilowatts, right? That's just the way these indices are set up. 
but you would just basically count the number of interruptions you have per year. Maybe you can get these from say like a smart meter, you can get these from your outage management system. And you just normalize by number of customers served and you get a number for safety. The SATI number is the number of hour, hours or minutes you're out per year. And so you, sometimes this is done in hours, sometimes this is done in minutes. But if you were gonna sum up all the customer interruptions and these are going to be typically events longer than five minutes in length. These are sustained interruptions. If you normalize this by number of customers served, then you get this SADI number. Uh, another number that's used by utilities is KD, Customer Average Interruption Duration Index. And so this is when a customer has an interruption. For those customers that are interrupted, you look at the total amount of time they're out and you normalize this by the number of customers um, interrupted. So basically what this is measuring is really the response of the utility to fix the problem. And so if you had a number that's two hours, that means on the average, uh, it means that for those customers that would have an outage, they can expect to wait two hours. There's another index, average service available index, where you take the customer hour service availability, you divide through by the customer hour service demand, which is basically kind of an availability number. I haven't really seen this used that much. Mostly for sustained interruptions, it's like the KD, the SADI, and the safety numbers. So there's a site for the U US government um, EIA, and you can find this at EIA.gov, where they track all data from utilities. Utilities are basically reporting their reliability information on an annual basis. And so they kind of gather all this stuff together and add it up and they put it in different sort of charts and reports and things like that. And this is it's just a little bit old, but this kind of serves a point in that you can kind of see right away where we're generally at in terms of safety and safety numbers for the United States. And you'll note in here that there's a dark red and a light red. And the dark red are the regular types of events. The light red are what we refer to as major events. So again, a major event would be like a big storm um, where a regular event would be something where you have like the wind kick up in a certain small area or an animal gets into a line or something like that. But in the United States, typically what they do is they just do the safety and safety calculations when for the, the non-major event days and the major event information is all kind of tracked separately. So you can kind of see where we're at as far as safety on average, we're about two hours, that's 120 minutes. And you can see we're about one event per year on the average for customers in the United States. But what's kind of interesting is to look at how this is changing with time. And in the dark red, again, you have the statistics calculated excluding major events. And then you have what's shown in here in light red with the major events. And what this is showing is on the average, you know, for normal sort of reliability events, that's kind of staying somewhat consistent. But then you might think that if you looked at this data that we may be trending upwards as far as outage hours associated with these major storm events. And so it's, it's kind of hard to say, but there's been discussion about whether this curve might actually be doing this maybe due to things such as climate change. And, and if this is the case, then we're probably gonna to have to get a lot more focused on doing things about these major events. But then, you know, we don't know because, you know, maybe what's gonna happen is this curve's gonna do something like that, right? And so that's kind of the, the, the discussion right now in the power industry is how, how is this trending? And do we, usually, do we have to spend a lot more money getting prepared for these major events as opposed to um, the non-major events? So here, we're gonna be focused more on non-major events in here, but it does kind of tie in somewhat, you know, to the major event response as well. So 
as far as these indices that we have, you know, the Safi, Sadie, and, and Katie, say we're not really going to be doing anything with the ASAI number, but if we want to address this safety number, the number of outages per year, we basically have to find a way of reducing the number of interruptions. Okay, we just have to reduce the number of these contingencies. If we want to cut down on the safety number, there's a couple things we could do. We can either decrease the number of interruptions or we can cut down their duration. And the KD number, basically, if this is the time it takes to respond to an outage, basically, we got to get crews out there faster, more people out there faster respond, or we need to have some type of automation, which we'll talk about in this class, to automate the switching to get these customers back online. Um, this shows some of the momentary indices uh, called we call the MAFI. And these are events less than five minutes. A lot of times these are like reclosing operations. And technically the MAFI number would be you take the total number of customer momentaries and you divide by the number of customers served. However, a lot of times when you have momentary interruptions, you'll have a number of interruptions corresponding to the same cause. And so a lot of times like reclosers will operate like multiple times for a fault. And so what we, normally use is a is a, um, kind of a weighted MAFI term um, called MAFI E, where basically what we do is we lump um, momentaries associated with the same reclose or respond to a fault, we lump those together. And then these are referred to as momentary events. And then we normalize that by the number of customers served. So again, we talk about these major events. Uh, there's different terminology for this. Sometimes these are called major events. Sometimes these are called major event days. But these major events, as I mentioned before, are really severe storms or their floods. There's icing. Um, this usually takes like a number of days to clear up. And and typically, you know, historically, maybe these only occurred like once every few years. Um, these are normally associated like with severe weather warnings. Um, you'll have a large number of customers out as a result of this. And a lot of times like a, a utility will be overwhelmed or they have to have crews coming from outside to handle this. In the past, the rationale was that it's really too expensive to design systems that withstand all major events, which is why they categorize um, these events into non-major versus major, you try to address the non-major events and then whatever happened during major events would, you know, would, would happen right. Um, normally when these major events occur, if there's sustained interruptions, there'll be special investigations and things like that. We had this major storm, major hurricane in 2012, Hurricane Sandy, where a number of different state commissions looked at utility response to this. And, and normally when there is like a major hurricane or an ice storm, which, which takes a lot of people out of service, there is an investigation. Um, but, but right now, like historically, these haven't occurred so often that utilities would necessarily be spending a lot of money to um, prevent the, the outages, you know, um, they had for some of these things. But I think that's probably gonna be changing. And so if we do again see that there is a trend up in these major event days, then yeah, we're gonna have to start looking at how we make grids more resilient and figure out a way that we're gonna actually pay for this. So when we talk about reliability, we can break it down to what level of the system this is occurring at. And for transmission, actually transmission doesn't really cause that many outages. Um, they might affect a lot of people, but the fact is that transmission systems are divide, designed to be set up in grids, there's loops. So if we lose one line, we, we don't necessarily lose a lot of customers. And so those systems are by design set to be more resilient due to the loop structure. Subtransmission is kind of the same. Maybe if there's a radial segments, we can have a lot of issues with reliability. But again, this is 
overall, a, a small part of the overall outage picture. Substations, we do have failures, but we don't really have that many failures of say like transformers and key substation components. Really, where most of these reliability issues are at on the distribution feeder, because that's where we have a lot of exposure due to like the overhead and cable and elements like that. Um, another thing you'll see sometimes too with the reliability numbers is sometimes you see these reliability numbers with and without what they call LOS or loss of supply. So the idea would be that if there's an outage, you wouldn't want to know, well, was this because the transmission generation failed versus the failure at the distribution level? And so when you have a number um, that is set up where with LOS or without LOS, that's where basically they try to break it down to what's caused at the transmission level versus what's caused at the distribution level. So obviously in here, we're going to be focusing on distribution. All right, so I think we're going to stop this um, right here and we'll pick up on this in the in the second video then.